Hey, this is John Dervaj with Our Revolution Colorado Springs. Uh, before we begin the interview, just want to let you know from exciting events that we have going on this m- month. There's going to be a Organized to Win 2020 Summit in El Paso County uh, for Our Revolution Colorado Springs. Uh, it's going to be primarily an event to discuss local issues, feature progressive candidates. Uh, again, that's going to be occurring on February 29th at Goat Patch Brewery from 12 to 3. Uh, in Colorado Springs, so really try to get as, we're trying to get as many people to come to this event as possible. It should be a really exciting, fun event. Uh, there's also going to be a uh, group protest as Donald Trump's campaign is actually going to be rally, having a rally in Colorado Springs. It's going to be on the 20th, uh, Thursday, February 20th, uh, in at Austin Bluffs Parkway in the Broadmoor World Arena. So we're compa- we're going with a bunch of other groups uh, to try to promote. Our revolution there. Uh, register people to vote and really just kind of spread a, uh, a good message ag- um, against uh, Trump and his hateful sort of rhetoric. So uh, please join us there as well. Uh, we're also going to continue to have debate watch parties for all the debates throughout the month, uh, as well as canvassing events uh, and door knocking events throughout the city uh, as we tr- try to get prepared for Super Tuesday, uh, where we vote for Bernie Sanders to be our next president. So thanks. I uh, hope you enjoy the interview. Hey, I'm John Dervage with Our Revolution Colorado Springs. With me today is Diana Bray, who's running for United States uh, Senate for Colorado. Uh, Can you just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, about your campaign, and kind of like, I guess, how things are going now that we're in 2020? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Things are going great with the campaign. And um, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm also a mom of four kids. And I've been involved in climate activism for about 10 years now. The way that I got into my interest around climate action and climate activism is that my husband and I and our four kids were in Australia. My husband's Australian. um, And we saw that they were going to be dredging a harbor right near this island that we love more than any place in the world. And building four, four, it turned out to be three, but four liquefied natural gas plants on this gorgeous, pristine island that was essentially an island um, that was a national park, and they did do that thing. And when we got back home to Colorado, my husband said, look and see what's going on. Research this. My husband is like Crocodile Dundee. He doesn't do computer. And so um, I did. I looked on the computer and tried to research it. And researching about what was going on in Australia, I learned that uh, what had happened was that Colorado had become a petro state. We now have 65,000 active oil and gas wells. We have an F rating with the American Lung Association. This started my activism and my energy and my interest in climate. And uh, so that, I'm sure we'll go more into that, but that's one major issue of mm. uh, my interest. And so in terms of my campaign, I'm always working on these issues related to the climate emergency. Yeah. But then also, I'm a clinical psychologist. And so I, I got my doctorate at University of Denver 31 years ago. And um, I have very deep interest in mental health and public health issues. I'm a proponent for single-payer Medicare for all. I actually uh, love the Bernie Sanders plan. And I've written a primer that describes what his plan is. Mm-hmm. I looked very carefully at both Elizabeth Warren and uh, Bernie Sanders plans and others, and um, I feel that Bernie's plan is the best. Uh, Increasing people's payroll tax, both employers and employees, I think is the way to go. The insurance companies are profiting off of our injuries, accidents, and illnesses to 100 billion a year, and I think we need to get rid of the insurance companies. So maybe we can go into more detail about that too. Um, Then I'm also interested in immigrant rights, uh, undocumented uh, worker rights. Um, reducing gun violence, and anything that's connected to um, reducing inequity. Uh, That's sort of like my platform in a a nutshell. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to go with there. I think we'll start with uh, the first one. So can you describe, you know, like you say you were a climate activist. Like what have you done like in the past? Like what's some examples of like what that actually like entails? Yeah, so it's interesting because, of course, um, being an activist, there's protesting, there's rallying. But there's what I came came to realize is I've been to protests where there's 400,000 people, like yeah. in New York in 2014, at Keystone, and, and also in 2014. There are protests and rallies, and there is um, civil disobedience. There's peaceful protests. But really, the only way to get truly involved is to uh, get in at the legislative level. And um, 
you can protest all you want, but that's not going to change what's actually happening, yeah. except for to inspire other people to get involved, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so what I've been doing since um, 2012, 14, 16, and 18 is working on the citizen ballot-led initiatives to try to regulate fracking. Um, it was heartbreaking yeah. in 2014 uh, because people don't realize that a lot of people don't realize that Jared Polis funded two incredible measures that would have given us an environmental bill of rights and also would have given us a 2,000 foot setback. Um, he was convinced by Hickenlooper Oil and Gas and also Romanoff was a supporter to drop those two initiatives. They yeah. thought that the oil and gas companies would come after them as they always do. Doesn't matter what we do, they will come after and they will be very negative. Well, Udall and Romanoff both lost in their election. So we didn't accomplish anything and it's heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking to us then because we realized what was happening. Uh, we would have had a 2,000 foot setback in local control. Instead, uh, former Governor Hickenlooper essentially sued counties and towns that try to limit fracking and ban, ban fracking. That was devastating. So I was involved in that effort. I was involved yeah. in 2016, similar. And then in 2018, I was involved in Prop 112, what yeah. we call the Safer Setback Measure that would have kept fracking out of our neighborhoods, 2,500 foot setback. We were outspent 40 million to 1 million, and so that was also real devastating. But I was I was in on that in terms of working integrally with with Food and Water Watch and what became Colorado Rising and also 350 yeah. in uh, developing the initiatives and fundraising for them and boots on the ground the entire time. Awesome. What was incredibly disappointing to me about the 2018 uh, uh, outcome, and this is the reason that I decided to get into this race, is because the four Democratic gubernatorial candidates, none of them supported Prop 112. And if you have, you know, this progressive, you know, seemingly progressive gay gubernatorial candidate who's saying, ah, that goes too far, yeah. well, of course, people are, are going to say, yeah, that does go too far, and um, that's that's not something I can support. That's why I got into this race, because I want to be a candidate that brings voice to whatever initiatives are coming, and I can do that better than anyone else, having been through this experience. Yeah, there's always like this sort of argument to be like that moderates or people who are trying to be more centrist or make that you need to appease like both sides. And in that sense, you have to give up certain things. I mean, I guess in my question, then ultimately, why do you think uh, Prop 112 failed ultimately? I think there are two or three major reasons. Uh, First of all, we were outspent $40 million to $1 million. Yeah. Uh, that's one reason. And, um, you know, money has taken over politics. But I think actually the greater reason is because we didn't have Democrats supporting it. Mm. We had Republicans, of course, going against it. Um, but when you have Democrats who can't bring themselves to that position, I actually blame the Democrats. Um, when you have Governor Hickenlooper saying that if it passed, he was going to as he's walking out the door in a lame duck session, essentially uh, create a special um, session to dismantle it. Mm -hmm. When you have Democrats who aren't willing to regulate the oil and gas industry, I think that is extremely toxic. Yeah. And that's why I decided to jump in because I can be that voice that typically uh, other Democrats have not been willing to be. Yeah, another argument I've always heard too is like, it never really introduced this idea like Bernie Sanders' platform does with a just transition, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like a lot of the ads, the all that we saw was it's going to hurt Colorado jobs, it's going to hurt our economy, people are going to get fired, laid off. There was like nothing really in the proposal about like what would necessarily happen, and I'm not entirely sure that's all 100 percent true. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I mean, that's what the, that was the propaganda. That, that's, that was the message from the Republican Party, or at least the the oil and gas industry. Um, do you think that there's like better messaging that could could occur in the future for that sort of thing? They hit it out of the park with their messaging, the yeah. other side. They were very strategic and they actually hijacked our message of protection, which is unreal. Like yeah. protect our schools <laughs> when we now have a situation like in Bella Romero Elementary School where kids are being poisoned because of benzene exposure yeah. right outside their playground. So that was a, an absolute falsity and they were extremely strategic, but of course, we need a just transition. That's what that's what this plan is all about. Bernie Sanders plan, Bernie Sanders Green New Deal, which is the new Green New Deal, goes further than the original one. Yeah. And it's fabulous because it talks about a just transition. There are about 30,000 oil and gas workers in Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, not 250,000 like the oil and gas industry claims. 
Um, you can't count the person who's at the 7-Eleven who's, you know, um, you know, organizing the coffee machine. No, 30,000. So there's 300,000 people, for instance, in the outdoor um, environment um, uh, area in, in Colorado and working yeah. in those sorts of jobs. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, our messaging can be better, um, and we have to absolutely um, embrace protection and also the just transition so that those folks who are working in that industry have a way to yeah. move into other work. Yeah, and I think, too, like, you, like have, telling those stories, too, about, like, the negative impacts, like, you know, the elementary school or, I mean, just the, the devastation that we're seeing around the globe. I mean, you mentioned Australia. We don't even need to bring up the fact that I don't even know how much their, that land is on, you know, on fire to the rising temperatures and forest fires. I mean, that's not out of the question for Colorado. I mean, we've had, obviously, very bad forest fires in recent history as well, right? So, like, I feel like the messaging could even go to, like, you know, what do we need to protect? Well, we need to protect, like, ourselves and our future because, like, we're the ones at risk here if we don't, you know, shape up and get things around. And then, yeah, like, from an economic perspective as well, like, there's so many, you know, economic advantages for switching over. So, yeah. I think um, the Gazette, which is a local Colorado Springs newspaper, I think called you, what, the poster child for, or was it the po- poster girl the poster girl for climate activism? Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any comments on that? Or? I think I'll just take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a little bit insulting because I'm nearly 60 years old. Yeah, um, and would they say, yeah, would they be like a poster boy? <laughs> I don't think they'd say that if you're, yeah, dude. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I do support the protesters and the people who are taking direct action and more is coming. Look, we're not afraid to uh, go and, and protest and to um, have our voice heard when the alternative is what we're seeing in places like Australia. How do you wrap your mind around uh, 85,000 koalas that have been burnt? How do you wrap your mind around people having to go and literally walk into the oceans and rivers and lakes and billabongs to try to protect themselves from fire? And you're right. That yeah. is going to happen here. Yeah. It already has happened here in California yeah. where people are incinerated in their homes and cars in, yeah. in California. So, of course, um, none of us are immune. But the part that I'm most interested in is the fact that um, our most vulnerable populations are going to be most adversely affected. And, you know, places like Bangladesh, places like Bahamas are going underwater, places like Haiti will not be able to recuperate and survive after, you know, catastrophic events. And even if you don't believe or sort of uh, uh, kind of hold on to the environmental pitch, the economic pitch is very strong. Yeah. And I mean, like, we'll go into it later, but obviously all of that will have repercussions from an immigration perspective, right? Because all those displaced yes. people need to go somewhere. Yes. And they're going to go to places that aren't underwater, obviously. Yeah, so people will be trying to escape uh, their homes and the places they have always been because when you can't have access to clean water, when you can't grow food, you need to leave to survive. 200 million to a billion climate refugees is the current estimate. All the coastal areas will be flooded um, everywhere. Huge parts of Southeast Asia will be underwater, and the... People of privilege will literally be trying to get to high ground, yeah. and people who don't have privilege will be scrambling to get to high ground to save their families. Yeah. The other uh, aspect is like to uh, bring in here too, um, like infrastructure, because like mm-hmm. obviously there's a lot of discussions and, tr- and initiatives trying to get Colorado to fix our roads to, you know, create more highways or at least better highways, more lanes. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on infrastructure as well? Like, do you think that? Would you be more of a advocate for like more public transportation, like a rail system between the uh, the front range? Yes, high speed rail, of course, um, we have to go that way. High speed electric rail, but also the federal government is not doing all it can do to incentivize these kinds of programs, and that's where um, we need people like myself who are going to push for those incentivizing green energy, incentivizing electric vehicles of any of every type. Once we move to electric vehicles and we get solar panels and wind, we then have a pathway forward. But <clears throat> until we're willing to give up our dependence on coal, uh, those that pathway is not open to us. So, of mm-hmm. course, and who's going to build those systems? The Americans are. Yeah. People who are here who are transitioning out of the fossil fuel extraction industry can be building those systems. That is our future. And the only reason that we are locked into this other um, paradigm, which is just extremely archaic at this point, digging fossil fuels out of the ground and transporting them by train and then burning them like we have at Drake right here. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this is something that worked 100 years ago. It doesn't work now. If we don't transition into what you're suggesting, uh, new infrastructure, 
um, a new clean energy, then the humanitarian disaster will be beyond what we can even imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and I think too, like mentioning Drake, I mean, like what always just boggles my mind is that they have this giant power plant, like this coal burning power plant. They're opening like a sports stadium that they're trying to advertise, will like, bring in people and like help, you know, bring in tourism. Like, no one's going to want to go to a sports, like, you know, stadium when there's like a coal plant right next door, like in the downtown area right next, right here in the mountains. So, yeah, I think it, several good points. And it's really good to see someone who's like, you know, willing to fight for, you know, our future because it's, it is really critical that we start. Um, I think I'd like to transition now into your background as a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. So how has that experience, like your, you know, your, all, all the uh, experience you have in that field, like really help um, shape your view on how our medical system is today? Well, I think it's enormous advantage, actually, to have this kind of background rather than a political background. Although I've always been obsessed with politics and watch everything and, you know, all the hearings, all of it. I'm watching at midnight because I can't have, I don't have the time during the day. And so I watch until I can barely keep my eyes open. Um, <clears throat> coming down here, I was listening on the radio to the Republicans giving their pitch. So my obsession has always been politics, but I think it is enormously helpful to come from a different um, experience and paradigm. And... I see everything from a, a psychological lens, yeah. um, and that really influences um, all of my understanding about what's going on in the country, on the planet at this moment. Um, I think that, um, as we were just brief, as, we, as I briefly mentioned before, um, our medical care system is actually the actual medical care that we have access to. Some of us is unbelievable, world yeah. class. But the problem is that we now have 80 million people who essentially either are underinsured or have no insurance at all. 30,000 people are dying each year because they can't get to a hospital. Yeah. 500,000 people going bankrupt because of medical costs. Our system at the moment is one that just works for people of privilege. Yeah. And it is unsustainable and it is not what most wealthy countries do. I believe that healthcare is a right um, and it shouldn't just be for people of privilege, but that's the system we have right now. I like Bernie's system because I believe that getting rid of the co-pays, the deductibles, the premiums, um, and calling it a tax, I think that's extremely important to call it for what it is. It is a very small tax. People who are making about $50,000 a year with after taxes with four children would pay $874 a year for the whole family, yeah. but it would be expanded, so it would be health care, um, that includes uh, mental health, disabilities, vision, hearing, and dental. Yeah. Love it. Fantastic. And so with that expanded plan, I think that we would all be sort of rowing in the same direction rather than supporting these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of insurance companies that are basically uh, sucking the lifeblood out of us, literally. So I would like to see insurance companies out of the picture. I do not agree with Pete Buttigieg. I don't, I don't believe that his system for, you know, Medicare for all who want it would work because I believe that many people who wanted it would not be able to get it and yeah. that we wouldn't have the bargaining power. So, yeah, I just want the middlemen out. And I, I think it's great that we have a private system. Um, we're not like England where they own the health care yeah. system and also yeah. administer it. Not yeah. like that at all. Um, we're more like Canada or Australia where there are uh, private hospitals and private doctors, but that the administration, I believe, should happen. I think the government would do a better job um, than the insurance companies, and it's because the insurance companies are in the business of making profit, yeah. not in terms of, you know, they're not interested in our health. No. In fact, their model relies on us being sick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they want to try to find as much of a reason not to give us care because that just comes out of their costs, right? Exactly. So, like, I mean, I, I always think back to, like, my, my grandma had a uh, she fell on some ice, and it said in her insurance that she would that like ambulance ride was covered. But so she went and uh, when she went to the hospital, my mom looked at the bill, and the ambulance was on the ambulance ride was on the bill. So like she, had, my mom had to spend like some, several days on the phone with this insurance provider, basically arguing that hey, no, this is not actually allowed, or this is this should be you know covered. And it's just like like I there's so many people who don't have the time to do that, yes. right? So they just, they don't do it, right? Like, that's what I think is like, they just, they get, they get screwed over. They don't get their full coverage, even though they're paying for it, just because it's so much of a hassle. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I, I'm curious on what your thoughts are too. Like, you know, obviously like Medicare for all who want it, like having these like a public option, kind of what originally I think several Democrats and um, for Obamacare were trying to advocate for. 
In your mind, why wouldn't that work? Like, why wouldn't that go far enough? Um, don't get me wrong. I think it was a good first step, the ACA program. It's just that it's unaffordable for most people. Yeah. And just to give you my personal example, my husband was diagnosed with melanoma. Um, my appendix ruptured out of the blue. One of my daughters um, broke her same arm in two different places, playing two different sports in one month. Um, another daughter had a tick-borne illness and had to be hospitalized. All of those things cost $500,000. Yeah. Um, and there are other times when we're perfectly healthy and we still are having to argue with our healthcare insurance company and it's yeah. it's unbearable like to spend that amount of our lives arguing uh, arguing for payments and deductibles it is it is unbearable and it's it's also it's also a problem because because I call it being golden handcuffed. We have to stay with our insurance companies. We have to stay with our jobs. Yeah. Um, if we lose our job or if someone um, gets fired or has to be away because they're taking care of a loved one, then essentially you lose your insurance. Yeah. And so it is a entrepreneurship killer. I think that if we didn't have our jobs connected to our insurance, then it would entrepreneurship would blossom in this country because people would finally go live their dream and do the thing that they really wanted yeah, to do. They wouldn't have to worry about it. They wouldn't have to worry about it. They have insurance. Yeah. And I've lived in a place that's like that in Australia. I actually had three of my babies here and one here, one, one in Australia, and it was just a much better system. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't, there wasn't the stress of how am I going to pay for this. And because I've lived there as well, I've experienced another system. And People are not saying, oh, I can't get in. There's none of that complaining because all the other crap that we have to deal with here yeah. that's unbearable, they're not dealing with. Yeah. And yeah, so if you have to wait a half an hour in a doctor's office because you've had to go in at the last second and they have two people in front of you, you just sit there and you wait and it's fine. And but, everything yeah. else you're not doing. Well, I mean, it seems to me like the American system, it's you, you get priority in that queue if you have more money versus like... In other systems, you get priority in that queue if you have an actual emergency. That's right. right. And I mean, that seems like a lot more of a uh, smart way to handle healthcare. Is you know, let's focus on the people who would, like need the care as soon as possible, not someone just has a million dollars that they can go see a doctor within like ten minutes, right? That's right. It's a real falsehood that the insurance companies are keeping us safe. Yeah, I mean, that's not their job. Their job is, I mean, their job isn't to keep us safe. It's their job is to make as much money as possible at the expense of us. So, yeah, I think, I think that's smart too. And I think like what, I, what, again, what concerns me is like you, you see it a little bit in Elizabeth Warren's plan, but I think even Elizabeth Warren's plan covers mental health, which I think is critical. Uh, and as I'm sure you well know. Yes. Um, and I mean, I, I think back at just how many people need that care in uh, today's world, like, you know, so many diseases of despair, so many people need yeah. to go uh, seek help. I mean, and then people coming back from endless wars and people, you know, homeless people on the street. I mean, like that care needs to be provided and you can't just expect people to pay for it. Well, that's right. Um, we have a crisis in this country of opiates. We have a crisis in this country uh, of suicide. Uh, just those two together about 100,000 people a year are dying from just those two. And yeah. we also have a problem where essentially people cannot get the preventative services, and that includes mental health. Yeah. Um, essentially, mental health services are not available except for, for people who can you know, spend $200 an hour to go, to go see a psychologist or psychiatrist, um, and that is not covered by insurance. Yeah. So most people are missing out on mental health services. And then the problem is that those kinds of uh, deficits are then accentuated and we get to the point where the smaller problems become really insurmountable um, because we haven't addressed them early on. So yeah, Elizabeth Warren's plan, there's aspects of it I like. Um, I don't think it has a strong mental health component, but also the part that I'm most unhappy with is that it relies on, um, basically it relies on being able to change the tax code. And of course I want to change the tax code. I want the rich to be paying more, but her plan relies on that happening and I don't want to wait that long. Yeah. I like Bernie's plan because it basically says, yes, you're going to have a tax. It's honest. Yes, you're going to have a tax. Your payroll tax is going to go up this much. The employer t payroll tax is going to go up this much. But in terms of what you're outlaying for health insurance, yeah. it's going to be much, much less. So I prefer that plan and I don't believe uh, Elizabeth Warren's plan is workable saying that there's going to be no yeah. increase in tax. And unfortunately, it didn't used to always be that way. I mean, I think it was just, 
there's a bit of a backtrack there in that sense. I think it's also tied to immigration as well. Yes. So it's like in tied to like your immigration bill, which I mean, I, we'll talk about that next. Yes. Immigration is extremely hard to pass in this country. Um, yes. So yeah, that's a bit, bit of a concern. I agree. Mm. So um, on the topic of immig- immigration, yeah. um, uh, do you consider that like a, another like true crisis right now? What we're seeing at the border. Um, do you like and do you think that like the acts that are happening there are like are criminal? Yes. Are you talking about by our administration? By our administration, yeah. Yeah, I do. I believe that um, there are war crimes occurring, separating families, separating children from their parents, um, incarcerating people, incarcerating children. It's a horrible, horrible stain that we have on our uh, country right now, and we have done this kind of thing in the past. Um, so uh, the idea that somehow our behavior is is noble or that it's warranted is an absolute um, travesty. I believe that um, there should be a pathway for all undocumented residents already here. I also go further. I believe that ICE should be abolished. I believe that um, asylum should be broadened because right now it is people don't realize it's very hard to seek asylum. Yeah. There's only certain conditions. It has to be something that um, you know, some disparagement, some problem that you had with your government. But if you were having to escape because you don't have anything to drink because of climate change and your area hasn't had rain in three years, if you are someone who's the victim of domestic violence, if you are someone who's the victim of um, drug violence, none of those things are covered under asylum. So I would like to see asylum broadened, mm-hmm. and I would like to see us be more welcoming of yeah. people who um, are in need of, of, of coming here, and also the people who are already here, the 11 million people, the the million uh, DACA um, recipients. I would like to see them all receive citizenship and quickly expediated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, another um, aspect of this too, especially in Colorado, I mean, we have a lot of like private prisons Mm-hmm. Uh, in Colorado, and yeah. do you uh, do you support closing those as well? Yes, I do. I don't like for-profit prisons, and I think it's wrong to profit off other people's misfortunes wherever that comes. Mm-hmm. And uh, for people who are jailed, who are um, incarcerated, especially since um, the great majority of the people who are in jail are people of color, um, there's this horrendous. Um, uh, dynamic that we have right now that um, we are incarcerating people of color um, for very small offenses and the people who should be thrown in jail, like some of our current administration right now, who I believe um, need to be jailed because they have done um, absolutely dangerous and devastating um, uh, activity related to our national security and, and in terms of our democracy, yeah. they, those folks don't go to jail typically, although there are some going to jail right now. I think there's going to be more, actually. <laughs> One can but, hope. Yes. But yeah, no, so I, I believe in shutting, um, I don't believe that we should have for-profit prisons, and um, I believe that that, that, um, that ongoing crisis that we have of crowded prisons with people of color is yeah. another horrific, horrific um, dynamic that we have in this country that other countries like us do, do not have. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned, too, like abolishing ICE. Um, like, why do you believe in that? Um, I don't believe that we should have an organization whose sole purpose is to try to prevent people from coming to this country. And once they do, um, and once they're trying to go through legal process, um, to send them back where they came from. And maybe that's personal. You know, I believe that um, there's lots of ways to, to allow people to seek asylum. My family came over um, from Eastern Europe about 100 years ago because of the persecution that Jews were having in Eastern Europe. And uh, they were not always welcomed, actually. And it was yeah. very hard, even after World War II, for, for Jews to find any place but Israel um, and a few other countries that let them in. The United States was not welcoming. Um, and so I guess part of it is personal believing that we are a country that was founded on immigrants and yeah. I don't, and immigration. And um, for those folks who were already here and those indigenous populations, I feel that there's a lot that we could do to make reparations to them. And also, I'm in favor of reparations for descendants of um, African American slaves. So. Yeah. I believe that the country should be going that way in terms of um, fostering um, 
not just fostering support, but fostering um, pathways forward for people who are typically squashed, not doing the opposite, which yeah. I believe is what ICE does. Yeah, I mean, what I would, like, it stands for what, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. ICE, yeah, Immigration so, Customs Enforcement. Yeah. Like, why do they have an, why do they have an enforcement agency for that? Like, yes. if someone breaks a crime or break or breaks a rule or uh, commits a crime, there's other agencies that you know, catch them, local agencies or federal agencies, yes. but like to have an actual like agency just for immigration. Cost. I don't really, under, I don't understand that, but yeah. Um, so obviously like, you know, being in the United States, you know, the United States Senate, there's a big thing happening right now, United States Senate, uh, impeachment of a president. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you've been following it closely. Like, what are your thoughts on it? Like, have you, you I'm, I'm sure you've, you, you've uh, watched the Democratic side, and now the Republicans are going to start their sort of like rebuttal, I guess. Um, what, what are your views on the impeachment of, of the president? Well, I just would like to say that I've been a big proponent for the impeachment process for many, many months. And I think that I do have to give credit to Nancy Pelosi for holding off as long as she did, yeah. because I think that choice was a very good one. And I think that the impeachment hearing, um, you know, in, in front of the House was, was quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and... I believe that there will be a reckoning for those folks, those Republicans who are um, sticking with this president who has done such egregious harm to our country. Um, You know, he clearly has acted in his own best interest. He clearly has uh, sacrificed our national security. He clearly has um, tried to basically blackmail uh, another country, an ally. He clearly has changed um, sort of the way in which we do diplomacy um, to to the worse. Uh, so I believe that this impeachment uh, hearing right now, even if he is not convicted, um, is a really important process that we all go through. And I think that they will be reviewing and looking at this for a hundred years, uh, what was done at this time. Yeah. I think the the question I always I've been asking myself though is like is this really the right charge to bring against him? Like it obviously is a crime without a doubt. Like he mm-hmm. like without a doubt Trump committed a crime. There's evidence from you know the horse's mouth basically saying that this is what happened. Um, and obviously like but there, and there's also been clear uh, obstruction of justice um, as well. Um, but there's like other things that I feel like Trump could almost have been impeached upon earlier. You know like atrocities on the border um, and just previous, even like in the Mueller, Mueller investigation, there's plenty of evidence of an obstruction there. Um, do you think like those charges should have been brought against him as well? Or Yeah, I mean, I think they were trying to keep it really simple because they thought if we can prove this, then it's the end for him. But yeah. that is not a linear kind of, uh, that kind of linear thinking um, maybe might be um, unstrategic, but because their testimony, I believe, like Schiff's testimony, has been has been so brilliant. I understand that they wanted to keep it simple, but yes, I agree. I think they should have thrown in everything yeah. that they had. How about treason? Yeah. Okay. How about um, how profiting, about um, laundering of money? Yeah, profiting your off of your own properties. Like, how much did the yes. government spend on Trump hotels to board yes. those people? Like taking foreign money for your own campaign. Yeah. You know, like I I have friends who are living abroad. I can't take one dime from them. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say how would that you work? You know, for like I mean, and what he is doing is is in the stratosphere. So, so basically, I do think that um, Trump um, has abused his power. Yeah. and that there are people who are willing to call him on it. Um, but I feel that there's still hope, actually, for him to be out, and I'm the only one. I've been making a bet for 15 months now. I started literally in October, November of uh, 2018, which is my 46-cent bet. How, do you know about my 46-cent bet? No, I do not, no. Oh, okay, so my 46-cent bet is that Nancy Pelosi is going to be our first woman president. Okay. And people have been looking at me like I'm crazy, but I think she's going to be number 46. I think it's still possible, but the way that I think it might happen is because some of these other people who are implicated, who have been, you know, involved in all these schemes, yeah. like Giuliani and I mean, Pence is definitely Pence right. and yeah. also who are don't have the same sorts of protections as Trump. Um, all of these these folks, I think that they are not going to go down with the sinking ship, as yeah. we've already seen with Parnas. They are not going down. And so 
I don't think they'll stay on a sinking ship. And I think that if they can find a way to implicate some of those people, they're going to start to talk. But it might have to come through the Southern District of New York. New York. It might not come through the impeachment process per se. Yeah. And so I can't wait to see what's next. But, um, yeah, I believe it's a possibility. Yeah, that's uh, one can hope. Again, it's just... Uh, <laughs> You got to get a lot of Republicans on the side, even like moderate Republicans, such as like Mitt Romney. I mean, yes. he's, he's talked about it, but it's kind of one of those questionable things if you'll actually jump uh, the GOP ship, or the, I guess not even a GOP ship anymore, it's a Trump ship. Yes. Uh, I think the last thing I just want to mention too so you are uh, currently going to be primarying, right? It is a primary process to get on the ballot. Uh, can you just 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 to give a brief like overview of like what people need to do to you know help support you? Support, support yeah, your thank you so much. Thank yep. you. Yeah, well, it's really interesting. First, being an underdog, unknown candidate, there mm-hmm. are certain challenges that come with that. There's also certain very serious challenges that come with being a woman, yep. um, and uh, that we've never had a U.S. senator 142 years yeah. from Colorado. So. Um, people tend to think, and this is sort of the psychologist in me, thinking that the men are safer, white male um, candidates are safer, but that has not been borne out. They don't yeah. necessarily win elections because they're white and male, and um, people see them as more viable. But what, what I could really use some help with is uh, the petition process, and that's what we're going through now. So there's two ways to get onto the ballot. You can either caucus on or petition on. Yep. Um, half of us are caucusing and half of us are petitioning. And so what that just means is signing um, signing my petition, but also I'm looking for s- signature collectors here in Colorado Springs. Okay. People who want to collect for me, I have to get 1,500 valid signatures from each of the seven congressional districts, and a okay. valid signature is someone uh, who is a registered Democrat. So I'm looking for people to help me with that process and are willing to come to my campaign. And basically, you can be in your own city, but helping me collect signatures is only going to be for the next seven weeks. And then um, those of us who are able to petition on will we'll petition on because we've gotten enough signatures. Yeah. There's also the caucus project. People can caucus for one person and sign for another. So that is a real possibility for people at this point. Awesome. Yeah, and then we'll see who makes it onto the ballot. Then there's the primary that doesn't happen until June 30th. It's extremely confusing because Super Tuesday primary is, uh, we're part of that for the presidential election, Mm -hmm. and that happens on March 3rd. So the caucus for Senate is March 7th, the primary is June 30th, but the presidential primary is is March third, and yeah. that's extremely confusing. Yeah, I remember when I was when I was trying to look through all this too. It's like well, I don't know why they broke it up this way, but yeah. So primarily, look for petitions. Um, you can probably go to your campaign website. Yeah, my campaign website is dianaforcolorado.com, dianaforcolorado.com, or you can just email me personally, diana at dianaforcolorado.com. I answer every email. And um, we're having to do things really differently, um, you know, with volunteers. Mm. No woman has ever, or any person really, has ever petitioned on with volunteers only, which is what I'm doing <laughs> and attempting to do. Um, you know, I have um, I have this fantastic volunteer group right now, um, mostly college students, and I'm looking for people from Colorado College, actually, and, and also University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Awesome, um, yeah. My son is a graduate of Colorado College just four years ago, and, um, and I also um, had a daughter at the University of Colorado system. So anybody who's interested in participating in a campaign, there's a place. Um, or you know, anyone who's interested in climate, mental health, public health, one thing we didn't get to is gun violence and reducing gun violence. That's yeah. also a huge interest of mine. So that's that's sort of my platform, looking for people to help me. Banning, of, banning of assault rifles? Yes, of course. Awesome. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's the le- I mean, that's I don't want to say the least of it, but um, I have the strongest gun violence prevention platform of anybody, of anybody. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you just a quick little story if we have time. It's... Um, It's funny because when I was originally trying to figure out my gun violence prevention platform, I had to educate myself about what had happened in other states. And um, I I was talking with campaign staff and they were saying, well, sometimes people suggest a two or three day waiting period. I then go into the Gifford site and I read all their research. And basically they have ranked all the states from one to 50 in terms Mm -hmm. of how well they've actually reduced gun violence. Guess who's number one? California. 10-day waiting period. I'm like, 10-day waiting period? That's on my site. I don't think anyone else has that. So I want to try to prevent gun violence in any way possible. And I want that to um, happen by us taking more serious measures. I don't even use the language common sense um, gun violence prevention measures anymore because that word common sense doesn't even belong in this conversation. I want really serious 
yeah. gun violence prevention measures. So there, are, you can see them on my website. I have quite a lot of detail about this, actually. Um, the other uh, issue related to gun violence is um, related to uh, gun violence um, preventative measures in schools. And I don't agree with the way in which we're teaching our children to try to protect themselves, the drills, the yeah. safety drills. I don't agree with those because as a psychologist, I believe that that drilling, that that drill that they have to do is over and over and over again is extremely traumatic and it's yeah. causing anxiety and depression and suicidality in our kids. And they're trying to prepare for something that what they're doing is not going to keep them safe, but they're thinking that they have to go hide in a closet. So I have a whole other plan about um, the way in which to truly keep kids safe emotionally, because most kids are not going to be victim to that. So yeah. why are we putting through, putting our kids all through these drills that are not keeping them safe and are actually giving them this horrific anticipatory feeling of danger? I actually was meeting last night with the Colorado, Colorado Education Association um, because they're they're deciding who who to endorse if anyone this year, and I talked a lot about that with them. Um, the fact that um, we are teaching our kids that they have to hide to be safe um, is a really terrifying kind of uh, experience for them to have. And yeah. I think there's other ways that we can teach resilience in our kids rather than the drills. So I have a lot of thoughts about. Uh, gun violence and reducing gun violence, not just in schools, but also we have a major injustice issue connected to race as well yeah. um, that is largely ignored. Um, yeah. And that is another part of my platform looking at the at racial injustice and, and social injustice connected to gun violence. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's um, I think it's something that this country desperately needs. And I think like, as we've seen in, I mean, it's so easily forgotten these like traumatic, horrible mass shootings. It's like they happen within something else. Trump probably does something to try to start another war yes. and we just forget about it. But like 50 people are El Paso. I mean, people don't even, like, people are not even talking about El Paso anymore. I mean, it's just like. Another one a few nights again. Yeah, it's yeah. Not... It's just, um, and again, I think the biggest thing is how other countries don't see, you know, we're not seeing this in other countries. That's this right. is a uniquely an American problem. Um, and that's not something we want America first for is mass shootings. So, um, right. yeah. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for your time. Uh, it was great, uh, great talking to you. Yeah, great talking to you. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>